confusion we didn't get the chance to speak beforehand so can I ask are you Emily are you Dr Hipchin Dr Emily what are, what do you like please just call me Emily Emily yeah. thanks. welcome again nice to be formal <laughs> um well we we they did introduce you somewhat in the e-booklet but maybe people haven't read that so I was just going to read that out for anybody that's here who wants to know a bit about where you're coming from and what you're going to be talking about today that you can follow on after after that so Emily has has written a paper which is called Origins Relinquishment Adoption Frankenstein and what what she has said about this is Though adoption scholars sometimes claim it, and though it contains adopted characters, Frankenstein is not an adoption narrative. In fact, the character central to the discussion of the novel, the creature, is radically not adopted. His pain is that no one will claim him as family. And yet, the novel and its adaptations can provide a useful home for conversations scholars in critical adoption studies have about key concepts in the field. I'd just like to comment there, this is in America. I, I'm not sure if we have such a thing as critical adoption studies in Scotland or the UK, which is a bit of a worry, but uh, yeah, just needed to throw that in there. Um, but key concepts in the field, because it is actually a field of this, particularly questions about the meaning of embodied histories, the structures of origins, knowledge, and their value. The construction of kinship through naturalised reproductive strategies and, as Dr Emily will begin to address, the nature, source and consequences of adoption trauma, especially for adoptees. In this talk, Frankenstein provides material that will exemplify or support a re-examination of adoption trauma, which for many scholars is naturalised, ubiquitous, a starting point or a given. So take it away, Emily. Thank you. Um, so first of all, before I start, mm -hmm. uh, let me say something about critical adoption studies. Um, it's a, my gosh, probably 15 years old, not a very old field at all. There's a, I just put together a reader so that if you're interested in the field, you can get it. It's coming out in December um, from Rutledge. So you can just look for the critical adoption studies reader and then there's all kinds of information in there and excerpts from writers in the field. And the second thing I want to say is that this is a paper that um, I've been working on and that I um, I think the reason that you know about this paper is because of Alice Deaver, who, yes, who um, convened a, a symposium just a few months ago. And so um, if you've heard it before or if uh, if you need to ask me any questions or anything like that, um, please let me know. And it is a paper, so um, I hope I can fit it in in the in the time that you've allocated for me. And thank you again for inviting me. So after that introduction, um, I'm going to just start uh, with foremost writers, adoption trauma. Oh, and I'm sorry about my dialect. Please let me know if you have any questions about anything I say, because I'm sure I sound different. Um, for some writers, adoption trauma arises from difference and stigma or shame arising from the awareness of that difference, framed as non-normative or non-traditional. That is families that cohere without kinship created through biological reproduction, thought of as the usual way families are formed when they include children. Here, however, the difference in adoption and the trauma in that difference can be seen to derive from the particular kind of relinquishment adoption requires and what that relinquishment points to, the fiction that families necessarily, absolutely, and indissolubly cohere, particularly that the parent-child bond is never broken. Refocusing on relinquishment allows a reconceptualization of adoption difference as based in the way in which relinquishment derepresses a deeply upsetting awareness of the instability of family bonds, biologically formed or otherwise. Ultimately, the creature's body figures out that instability in its disunity, that is, the creature's piecemeal body shocking in its refusal to become whole, human, a recognizable derivation of its origins, its defeat of its maker's hopes and expectations, is a reminder that family is fictive and fragile. <laughs> 
The first published instance of the claim that the, the creature status, the claim for the creature status as an adoptee appears in Betty Jean Lifton's Journey of the Adopted Self. In that reference, an adoptee describes her trauma and feeling of alienation through the figure of Frankenstein, that is the creature. For the adoptee in Lifton's text, adoption makes her feel like that creature, isolated, alone, rejected, feared. Adoptees are like that, Lifton reports, but what does that point to exactly? Not to his adoption as the creature isn't adopted. The emphasis generally in adoption studies on adoption trauma is mistaken if meant to be specific to adoption. That is since Eric Wellish and H.J. Saints through Nancy Verrier and yesterday's essay on how adoption hurts birth mothers, scholars in adoption studies have been framing adoption trauma confusingly. Disentangling these observations and claims reveals that no one suffers from adoption as a specific category of experience, however much people might actually suffer in their adoptive families. Since much of the literature of harm focuses on adoptees in the US, that position is the focus here with a note that adoptive parents, adoptive families and relinquishing parents have also felt traumatized or said to be traumatized. Scholars have looked for the reason for adoptee trauma, some claiming that adoption harms adoptees by keeping them in ignorance of their origins. But of course, that can't be the source of specifically adoptee pain. Many people, perhaps most people in history, have not known their origins in any clear way, or have been ignorant of their quote unquote true origins, or have experienced rootlessness as exhilarating or full of possibility rather than painful. Perhaps most people even um, today don't have access to legitimating birth certificates or true stories of their infancy or parentage, though most white middle-class people in the US likely do or claim to. Lack of origins knowledge is not de facto or universally harming, even in the current climate of origins preoccupation in the US at least. Adoptees sometimes have claimed to feel painful alienation from their bodies because their bodies differ from those of their parents, but this too isn't particular to adoption and is a matter of context and degree. How much can bodies differ before there's harm and what constitutes notable difference? Adoption studies hasn't been particularly clear in its discourse, perhaps even in its conceptualizations, just what and how many and of what degree are the markers that create sufficient difference to produce trauma and harm through difference between the bodies of parents and children in any family, let alone in families created in adoption. Nor has the field adequately addressed what happens to adoptive bodily difference when the adoptive family isn't present for comparison and members of adoptive families don't mark the difference themselves as a projection of their identities. Whether adoption trauma can be said to be tied to the purely visible or visual or to the declarative or revelatory. Adoption studies hasn't looked at all the kinds of families, all kinds of families to see if bodily difference of itself creates harms. Scholars in either in the discipline haven't yet asked about the naturalization of intrafamilial cultures generally either, with a sense for where differences in these cultures and conflicts between them manifest harm. Families may frequently experience radical internal differences in culture. Conflicts occur between generations around sexuality and religion, politics, aesthetics, language, food practices, any number of things, some of them vital to what adoption scholars believe are crucial parts of birth culture. I don't know that we've yet looked at how these intrafamilial differences cause harm, nor come to, any, um, to many overt conclusions about the learned nature of birth cultures or their intersections in adoption studies discourse, at least with racism and eugenics. We do think such cultures are learned as through schooling, contact with birth parents, return visits, media representations, or culture camps, but we don't often talk about them, uh, we, and, but we often talk about them as embodied or natural. It seems important to note that discussion in adoption studies of the body as race and origins as natural tend to accept exterior notions of bodily meaning and stick people to geographies, languages, or other locations that they must then accept as originating, as primal to their identities and therefore inescapable. But of course, such human displacements from originating geographies are frequent in history as now. Adoption, refugeeism, emigration, attachment to the US military, or any military, elite boarding school experiences, poverty, moving for work, educational opportunities, these can all relocate people out of their originating places. Adoption is only one way of doing that and is among these perhaps not even the most common. 
at least in adoption studies, we have yet to say clearly what harm is done because none of us is in our, relig our original place in any of these ways. Instead, we often internalize a practice now largely abandoned in adoption agencies that is matching. Sometimes if we are ourselves adopted, we might produce nostalgia for a lost or necessarily fictionalized, fictionalized past from which we believe our bodies tell us we've been displaced. Or we might listen to what others tell us about our bodies and decide that only in some lost location we will feel normal, not different, finally at home. This nostalgia is not particular to our situation as adoptees. The naturalization of all these objections to adoption, naturalization one has to notice through the situation or meaning of the body, obscures the fact that when certain questions are asked, namely, what makes adoption different, adoption difference materially disappears. None of the things that adoption scholars usually claim produce specific adoption harm is located in materialized adoption difference, <clears throat> or indeed in demonstrable harm that can create particular adoption trauma. I want here to tackle for a minute the way in which we generally treat adoption, even historians can sometimes treat it, as a synchronous, fixed, and definite event, a thing that happens and happens generally in the same way, no matter to whom or when it happens. When asked, we might say, oh, right, Mesopotamian adoption isn't like mine, that's right, or orphan trains are so weird, or even as at a conference a few years ago, we might hear people reproach adopted people for having not been adopted enough because they entered matched families. But in discussions or in print, we tend towards adoption rather than adoptions and make general claims about adoption rather than one specific to materially or historically different adoptions as we try to sort out our assertions. In fact, I've been doing so here. We can often tend in these conversations to talk about adoption as being the kind of adoption we experienced if we're involved, involved in adoption in that way. Lifton's adoption was plenary, a closed record stranger adoption, and thus her adoption discourse deals with that kind. For many or for most transracial or transnational adoptions, adoption is that kind. For those adopted from foster care, that's adoption and so forth. It's quite possible that what I will note about incoherence around the family body for which the body of the creature is a metaphor is a general incoherence in the terminology deriving from a living, historical, and diffuse practice. It would be helpful, I think, if we could settle what adoption means, is, or means, or where it coheres, if it even does. Or if we can't, at least to say, as I will say here, that for much of what follows, I mean the kind of adoption that was practiced in the West, specifically in the US, during the late 20th and early 21st century, mostly by people who take in living children whose parents have legally broken ties with them. I think the kind of adoption we see, for instance, of the children of immigrants or nations actively at war or as part of deliberate state genocide, these takings in might not share some of the meanings or qualities I want to suss out here, especially around the idea of real as opposed to rhetoricalized agential relinquishment. It might be that when children are taken away before being taken in, rhetoric, by which I mean false narratives, is used to create false agency in order to produce the effects I'm noticing. I'm not certain, but to the point, I wanna be clear that the adoption I mean here is the kind where agency as is at worst liminal and at best asserted. When we've taken a good look at what we claim is different about adoption harm of this sort and seen that it isn't really specific to adoption, what's left is the feeling of adoption a phrase that commonly appears when other discourse on difference is overturned in conversation. And this feeling is undeniable, the feeling of difference, the way in which it has formed the personalities, characters, ways of being in the world of everyone involved in adoption is essential and material. It deserves attention. At a cafe table many years ago, I asked a senior scholar what she thought about this. Why did adoption scholars insist on difference despite so much thoughtful conversation that refuted all material marks of specifically adoption difference. Her answer was blood ties, the primacy of biological kinship tie in especially modern US culture, where is situated most of the work, work claiming and based in this difference. That is for most people, biogenetic kinship through heterocoital, uh, that word by the way, by the way is Marina Fedosics and it just means um, reproduction through um, heterosexual coitus. Heterocoital reproduction is normative, right 
true, and real, and all other forms of kinship are non-normative, thus adoption difference. One answer to that has always been that statistically, most families in the US reproduce non-heterocoidally, many through adoption, informal or formal, or through marriage, step or blended families, but perhaps as many through technologies of reproduction that fall outside heterocoidal reproduction, using gamete or embryo transfer, surrogacy, surrogacy, IVF, or other kinds of technologically enhanced reproductive processes that can disrupt blood ties. But this statistic also shows us that family has never been and still isn't settled or absolute, even in the strenuously nuclear family first culture of the past century in the US, as one thinks of that culture in white middle class suburban ways. We know from two centuries of stat, uh, census data, if not from our own experiences and, and anecdotes, that family can appear in numberless forms, including the nuclear one, but also as composed cross generationally or horizontally as including long-term employees, as nannies or housekeepers, um, as including sometimes multiple members kinned through remarriage, as arising in neighborhoods to raise children in precarious homes and so forth. Family is stretchy enough to metaphoricalize workplace relationships and kinning, the work wife. Why is adoption specifically outside what's normal if family is so otherwise accommodating? In a conversation with a colleague, I learned that he had been brought up in Buffalo, New York, which is um, west and north of here, where I had been born. He was delighted to find another Buffaloan, which obliged me to tell him that I wasn't from Buffalo in that way. I told him that my mother and father had been from Long Island, which is outside Manhattan, but that my um, mother had flown from flown to Father Baker's home for unwed mothers in Buffalo, where she was discovered to have gotten pregnant in her um, senior year in high school. She delivered at the home and signed me over to the institution, and I lived there at the orphanage for the first three months of my life. I told my colleague that I had been adopted and grown up elsewhere. It was a story I told often enough to make it not particularly special to me, but my colleague blanched and grew quiet and then unable to make eye contact, told me that he'd known about Father Baker's as a child, since that was where, when he was naughty, his father sometimes drove the both of them to make a serious point where he threatened to leave the boy who grew up to become my colleague if he didn't behave. Father Baker's was the materialization of the threat of abandonment and unfamilying. To be left at Father Baker's for being naughty meant relinquishment, not adoption. My colleague as a child was frightened of the place. Indeed, he displayed a lingering fear of it in his adult body language because he understood that unfamilying is a dire consequence, the most dire Besides death, it can in fact be death. In my own family, being discarded was a constant threat. My father offering to return my younger brother, who was a difficult child, threatening to send me back to the orphanage when I was ill as a child and later to institutionalize me for an illness as a teenager and to leave me there if I didn't get better. The threat that any of us would be returned or reinstitutionalized or severed from the people who materially cared for us in our adoptive homes was the air we breathed as children in my family. At 18, I preempted this nonsense and left home, but for my first 18 years, I was metaphorically sitting in front of Father Baker's most, day, listen, most days, listening to my father talk about the possibility of my undoing. There is nothing particularly new in saying that relinquishment is a better site for finding the reason for the persistent feeling of adoption as a traumatizing practice in the face of its essential lack of particularity among th things that cause harm. Adoption tra trauma is a misnomer we might do well to dispense with just to get at what we actually mean. Much of the work on adoption trauma points to relinquishment as the foundational source of damage, separation from the maternal in particular that initiates that iconic wound or hole or loss. Some of our work does focus on the harms of relinquishment, especially when it's addressing birth mother trauma, but most of our dress is often simply not specific enough to adoption. For instance, in looking at um, transnational and transracial adoption, we may examine the effects of consumerism, global politics, cultural oppression in sending countries, coercion from receiving countries, capitalist and settler colonial institutions and practices, and other ways of looking for at pernicious systems. But none of the, result, the resultant harms, the destruction of families, the racialization of groups of people, the objectification of the minoritized cultural and physical genocide and so forth is particular to adoption. We don't ado address adoption difference in our analysis. We can and do use our observations to explain and attempt to redress the socio-political conditions that result in the violence of child taking and rehoming. 
it is correct to notice the effect of these conditions on people's lives. Reproductive just injustice is real. As another colleague once said to me, one way you know you have power is you get to keep your children. However, in focusing on who or what creates the conditions of relinquishment and on those conditions themselves, scholars elide or diminish what a relinquishment itself means and does. Focus on the systems that create child separation is helpful and necessary, if only to counteract abuse. But as we do that, what we think about relinquishment becomes less clear. In his early work, Tobias Hubenate conflates slavery and adoption along the lines that child taking and child commerce are hallmarks of both systems. Other scholars followed this lead, arguing that adoption participates in a market for children who are exchanged as goods, sometimes remarking how black and brown families are destroyed in greater numbers and through practices that resemble or derive from those uh, used to subjugate the enslaved. Approaches like Viviana Zelizer's are useful in making the case that adoption was or had become in the late 20th century a form of human trafficking and a valuable commodity that is children. Outrage over rehoming, mixing with outrage over perceived callousness and comparing children to animals or highways, both can be adopted, continues this assertion. One culmination of this observation is the Reuters report in 2013 that held adoptive parents, social services, state facilitators of adoption, foreign governments and social media networks ultimately responsible for child trafficking through adoption and rehoming. Another culmination is the return in 2010 of a seven-year-old Russian adoptee alone on a flight to Moscow, repatriating the goods as if he wore a pair of def defective shoes to go back to the factory. But to imagine relinquishment as, producing, as produced solely by systems of repression has an effect on how we understand and examine relinquishment as a voluntary action. To blame systems of abuse for people's decisions, however properly, is to remove agency and responsibility for what they do. When that happens in discussions of relinquishment, it has the odd effect of reproducing the abuses so thoroughly derided when achieved by capitalist or consumerist adopters or agencies that place children in adoptive homes. It turns people into objects and silences them. To focus on system-based violence and coercion around a, a relinquishment can depersonalize decision makers, in particular birth mothers, who are still usually the figures who relinquish. That, of course, preserves the birth mother as a maternal sacrificial figure in adoption, something everyone may find comforting. It allows people to be angry at systems that they can call to dismantle, but not to be angry at particular women who gestated children and left them. The people birth mothers indubitably are, then just vanish, go silent, become less than fully human. This is one harm certain positions in adoption studies perpetuate, to note birth mother silence and absence, but to bind it all around with the insistence that her voice in adoption was entirely the product of irresistible forces, that she had no say, she just relinquished as she had to, and thus she becomes immaterial, another cog disappeared. But what happens if we return to adoption difference is a feeling that persists past any reason for it, past the non-reasons for it, and ask a slightly different question about this persistence in the context of the difference in adoption that marks adoptees. The, spe the specific kind of relinquishment that adoption requires, and then the meaning of that kind of relinquishment for what I think of as the usually positive valence of adoption in published public dis discourse appears. What happens in relinquishment is that a child is born and sometime in its childhood, its mother and father leave it, ending or having had ended their relationship to that child. This termination of parental rights unkins the child. In some adoption discourses, frees the child for adoption. The family free child can become then the ward of some institution or other group that can care for them until they are otherwise family or become an adult. <clears throat> One of the stories people tell about families insists that they are the most important things in anyone's life. Families can be undone by torture, addiction, abuse, can't be undone by torture, addiction, abuse, unloving, serial killing, batters, battles over wills, even the end of the world. There are families in heaven, or at least the family of God. Literally nothing ends family, even or maybe especially legalisms like divorce or emancipation. People believe family will help whenever needed, however grudgingly, will be supportive, and that's reciprocal. People show up for and support their family members in turn. Family is how people imagine their connections in the community and to others. One might lose lovers, friends, acquaintances, jobs, one's mind, but never family. 
This is one reason why adoption, that is the formation of family through taking in children, is colored positively by many people, including many who have had positive experiences in loving adoptive families. It's also behind positions like Elizabeth Bartholet's, Amy Coney Barrett's, and a whole slew of people who think that this taking in, think of this taking in as making family in the context of making those irreparable and supportive networks of bonds that keep vulnerable people from isolation and despair in times when they may need and depend on family for assistance, acceptance, reparation, kindness, even their very lives. When one thinks just of adoption, believing in this narrative of adamantine intimate family bonds, why wouldn't want one want more of it? Why shouldn't it be celebrated and championed? If the other option is no family network, no adamantine bonds, no intimate support, or worse, weak non-familial bonds that might rupture just when people need them, then of course making families is, a, is good, the more the better. In fact, statistically speaking, stable families can produce generational wealth, supply non-governmental assistance to those in danger, assist with immigration shock, develop employment, a bunch of things, and so forth. Most foundational theories of family posit it as producing civic good, so who wouldn't support adoption and creating families if this is the case? At some point in my own history, my father hissed at me, I hope they're dead, meaning, of course, my birth parents. Like most people of his time, class, and feelings, in order to believe in adoption, my father had to undo relinquishment disappear the gestational parents, either materially, <clears throat> excuse me, or psychologically. Lifton, whose writing on adoption applies at least to my kind, notes in Lost and Found that adoptive parents often narratively kill off or otherwise made absolutely gone the genitors of their adopted children. For a long time, my adoptive father's been dead now for 33 years. I thought about the things he said and decided that the problem for him was rights. My father wanted the rights to his children. And these had to be sole, uncontested, and immutable. But I have come quite recently to imagine instead of, or in addition to my father's sense of his rights, that his resistance to the four-parent situation was more subtle and more universal simultaneously. My father wasn't just assertive and authoritarian, though it was certainly that. He was afraid. Afraid to lose his children to other people. Afraid his identity as father would be rescinded or have to be rethought. Afraid his family would dissolve. What he was afraid of is real, material, and justified. It is, I think, behind the feeling of adoption difference. Relinquishment, which precedes adoption, undoes family bonds. That is, it literally undoes family bonds on and with the bodies formed through gestation and delivery. Bodies normally split in one way from the maternal at birth are then split absolutely from it through relinquishment. Paternal bonds are more formalized but still broken in relinquishment. The father of the body of the child is shunted away or relieved of his responsibilities or made to disappear once the child is given up. Relinquishment destroys these ties. That's its meaning. It matters, in fact, that the severance is usually nominally voluntary. The particular relinquishment required in most adoptions is, has to be really, or framed as, or kitted out to be chosen. These choices are not absolutely outside all kinds of contexts, of course, but the narrative of relinquishment requires consent give up, put up, surrender, all of the synonyms imply it more or less strongly. One can see its cultural import importance in the legal frameworks developed to ensure it, the tussle over waiting periods is one marker in the way in which particularly open adoption ceremonializes the handing of the child to the adoptive parent in various stories about how children end up in orphanages or agencies or lawyers' offices. One of the effects of contextualizing relinquishment in systems of oppression is to re-repress this knowledge of voluntary relinquishment that is, in a sense, written on the relinquished and perhaps adopted body as especially separate from the bodies it came from, written sometimes on the birth mother's body as well, as seen in the perennial fear reported by birth mothers in, for instance, Anne Fessler's collections of narratives and in birth mother memoirs that their husbands or doctors would know they'd given away a child because their bodies could not hide it. In order to produce the feeling of adoption, the gestational parent's agency has to be insisted on so that the, so that the having been cut intentionally from a family body, which it does not, as is normal, form up around reproduction, is interrupted by relinquishment, which is destroyed, as it were, just as it were coming into being, is apparent. In other words, the fact of relinquishment says out loud what everybody knows, that family bonds are only coincidentally sticky. In fact, are as often undone as they are maintained. It reminds people that families might be foundational, reparative, 
how identities sort themselves, but they are not indelible. The fear that this could happen to oneself is powerful, even overwhelming. Thus the rejection of the relinquished child that perhaps becomes adopted, but cannot ever shake free of the narrative of, re of relinquishment tied as it is to the process of adoption. One provides the context or cover for the other without relinquishment, no adoption. It is the reminder of what could and often does happen in the fictivity of connection, permanence, taking in stability of family bonds. I don't mean to suggest that people deliberately or consciously notice this, though of course sometimes they do, and sometimes they're consciously repelled by it. I suggest that this becomes the aura around the adopted person that creates in them a sense of difference pinned to adaptivity, but rooted in relinquishment that undoes the family right from the start. Relinquishment makes, the, makes overt the fiction of family ties, a fiction anchored in naturalized maternal connection. No reason, one reason why mothers are so fraught in adoption studies, which is broken and denatured in relinquishment and which breaking uproots or calls into question by analogy, all family bonds. I am suggesting that the feeling of adoption is really the feeling of relinquishment in the context of the fictivity of connective permanence through, of, through family ties. <clears throat> Sorry, a fiction that is remarkably taken up again by adoption. That is, adoption is intended to undo the harm of relinquishment and to reassert the permanence of family bonds, though this process fails where it is obvious or declared to exist. Closed or secret adoption creates another fiction, that of successful redress or the immateriality of the break. Perhaps this is why origin searches and reunions created and still create for some a kind of desperate fear, not just what will I be in my family, but what will my family be? It's the fear of speaking into existence the necessarily repressed knowledge of fracture. It's a representational anxiety about what relinquishment says about the porosity and fragility of all family bonds, including and maybe especially those deliberately created in adoption. It's the return of the repressed condition of existential or essential loss, or also ex existential too, <laughs> the feeling of continual and unceasing relinquishment of unfitness, unwantedness, of falling without a net, of not being enough. Perhaps it's simply that adoption, like many patches, calls a special attention to the defect. And that becomes a counterweight to adoption's natural positivity in a world that priv privileges the family tie, which might explain the shiftiness around adoption's affective meaning. Where that affective meaning intersects pernicious narratives of child saving is particularly salient, I think. The salvific narrative of adoption routinely affronts adoptees who don't need saving, thanks, or who ask the pertinent question from what are you saving me? That salvation is bigger and less conscious, I think, than simply rescuing a child who needs help surviving Bartholet's arguments limitations become obvious here, if not elsewhere. I think instead that the question of relinquishment and particularly whose agency is central, distress over the idea that the ch children one is adopting may not really need adopting because their parents actually didn't participate in relinquishment or didn't want to relinquish or lived in conditions that coerced that relinquishment. This signals something about what's being saved. Generally, we tell each other that children need families, we also talk about having children as starting a family, as if family didn't pre-exist any relationship or any life, isn't present all around the people who are considering considering starting a family, or that the child or or the child who needs one. It's probably obvious to say that children create family in a way that no other promise, document, event, or cohabitation can. Thus, the relinquishment of children, their unkinning, uncreates family, destroys it, undoes it. Uh, it points to the fact that family can be destroyed. All families, even families not formed in the aftermath of relinquishment. In saving the child, the adoptive pam parent is saving family. The concept, the reality, the power, the structure, this infrastructure underpinning everything. The idea of salvific adoption is a way to hide the reality of family fragility derepressed through agential child relinquishment is larger than I have space for here. And frankly, I need more time and discussion to figure it through. But I do wanna come back to this idea in Frankenstein and its afterlives in the body of the creature, relinquished out of horror and never adopted, and yet a figure some adoptees use as a metaphor for their experience. 
to return then to Frankenstein and the creature where I began, and I'm, I'm nearly finished. One thing to remember is that the novel at least does address adoption and has a number of adopted characters, but these are not monstrosities like the creature, and no one has claimed to feel like Justine or Elizabeth or Caroline. Just the creature, his lone, lorn, wandering, murderous, arsonist self. I keep coming back to the passage in which the creature wakes up and Victor's repulsion becomes so unbearable he flees. Why didn't it work the way Victor wanted? Why was the creature so monstrous? All the pieces had been selected or designed for harmony and beauty. Why this ugliness and horror? It was, of course, a failure of gestalt. The thing did not come together as the parts should have indicated it would. The problem with the creature that seems most interesting at this point in my thinking, the thing that keeps coming to the fore, the creature's essential incoherence and decategorization. That is, the creature doesn't become the thing Victor made, nor anything that anyone can name. It never has a name, proper or categorical, nor into anything recognizable, human or animal, if he has parts of both. He belongs nowhere and to no one, which makes it interesting as an object of contemplation and thinking about what relinquishment harm might be constituted by. The creature is built of pieces of other creatures, all of which had origins in other places, other people, other families. In thinking about his body and its failure not to point to its pieces, to become more than what it becomes from, uh, what it comes from, we can imagine it as a representation of both the complexity and bottomlessness of origin searches and of the family itself, the multiplicity of origins and of pieces, a source of an awareness of the knowledge of essential disunion, the fictivity of his being, um, of his being, a reminder of the fiction of unfailing unity through family. His rejection, which the novel posits again and again as the source of his violence, is a consequent of, consequence of what he represents that fracture that undoes family and that requires his monstrosity, his non-reproductivity, his ultimate torment and self-immolation. Thank you. Wow, that was really powerful, Emily. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. <laughs> so I, every time I, I think about this paper, I realize how little Frankenstein there actually is in it. You have to kind of <laughs> wind around to get to Frankenstein. Well, well, it's 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 really beautiful, as as is the the short story or the film, depending on how we know our Frankenstein. And I, at the end there, when you came back to speaking about Frankenstein, I started wondering about your own strength in creating a whole of the narrative of that includes so much pain and distress, and yet it's encapsulated in a paper that you've created something which stands as something beautiful as the uh, writer did, and as we are ourselves. So it's just so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're Thank going you, to see Emily. if there's any questions that um yes. coming from the the participants, if that's the uh, something that people have been putting questions into the chat. Um while we just will invite that if anybody would like to ask any questions, put them into the chat. Um, yes, ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> I have a I have a personal question though, because I, I, I like I'm I always like to know what people are going to be doing next. So Emily, from from this paper, where where are you going to go next? Where is the next step for for Emily? Where are we going to be following her? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! You know, um, I always have projects. You know, tons of yeah, and there's and work always gets in the way, which is kind of funny because work gets in the way of work. Um, but I think what I'm doing with this, so so. This is part of a bigger thing, obviously. Everybody says that, don't they? This is part of a bigger thing. Um, and the first place I started was actually, I was looking at, because I started thinking about Frankenstein as this very strange figure for adoptees, given the, yeah. And so I started with um, its brain, actually. So I wrote an entire paper about or the brain in um, the 19, oh, now I'm going to forget the year, 31, I think movie version of Frankenstein and then in Young Frankenstein, which is 72, I think. And the idea that Mary Shelley never talks about, like there's three or four sentences about what 
but everybody every filmic version of this has a, a has a idea of the body parts like it pictures the body and the brain and the heart are two that kind of show up mm -hmm. and they always come from somewhere whole and then they come into this body and i think and what i'm what i say about that origin thing about the origin of the brain is that this has something to tell us about origins because the brain goes into the body and then it it somehow is and isn't from where it, it's from you know so I wrote that part. And then um, I also looked at, there's a very early film version of Frankenstein um, actually by What's His Fern from New Jersey, Edison, where the creation of the body is, um, of, the, of the creature is in a cauldron. Like it's the weirdest thing you've ever seen. And um, that also is a piece about disunion and union, how you make and unmake people through um, adoption and relinquishment. And so um, I think what I'm saying is that the that I'm probably going to be writing more about this. I know I want to talk about um, the Branagh version of the Branagh filmic. There are over 400, by the way, versions now, reversions of TV and yeah. film. They just keep coming back to Frankenstein because I think because we're really obsessed with um, this this the family that we think of is under everything, and um, and and we have to we keep like pushing down the fact, yeah, that um, that family is is not as stable a place to build culture on as we would like it to be, even though we've been doing it probably as long as forever. So, so I think there's a I think there's a book here somewhere. I'm just not really sure what all the pieces <laughs> look like. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll be following your journey, and I'm sure so many other people here will be as well. It's 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 been fascinating. Um, Donna, you got some questions? Is there any questions in the chat? I can't really see. I can't see the chat. I can. <laughs> I absolutely can. Um, there's a couple of questions. I have comments. Yeah. Couple um, of... Go ahead. Go ahead. You can. Couple of comments in in the chat. Um. It was... Alison Perkins, um, wondering what Mary would think. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just read Muriel Sparks's biography of her, which is Muriel Sparks, right? Yeah, I think it is. It, um, it, and and I was like, I was fascinated by how um, tumultuous her uh, her family life was, like incredibly like dead children and dead mothers and multiple um yeah it was it looked really really modern to me actually it looked very contemporary the way she was living um and i thought i thought i wonder if she would like us to have noticed that yeah i don't mm. know she mm. was 19 when she did this like and then she was i guess she re rewrote it in um in the third in the 30s and 1830 so the 1818 one is the more interesting of the two to me and so she would have been oh god somebody do math it's way too early for math for me 12 and 19 is uh 20 no 31 she would have been 30 would she have been 31 yeah well, if i um heard this right was she not hanging out with like byron or somebody like that at the time so even yeah. in her current circumstances there was a lot of volatility I suppose <laughs> well and he was he was doing things like um having sex with her her stepsister in the yeah and impregnating her and then abandoning her and I mean it was yeah I mean Byron was mad bad and dangerous to know that's girl. what they say it's it's like they say you know but behind every you know famous powerful man is a good woman well behind every woman is struggling there's a man is mucking things up for her and I'm, I'm noticing sort of parallels with um, the earlier talk that being one of them because I hadn't heard about the connection between venereal disease and infertility before mm -hmm. um and the other one which I, I wonder if maybe yourself and or Dr. Josie would want to come on. Is the the difference between a predominantly um I don't know if we are now, but a, a Christian country, because that was surprising to me how different it was before Christianity when it was uh, the, the Roman world. I'm not used to thinking of these kind of historical things. And if it makes a difference to cultures um other than Christian. Mm 
if they have different um and, and and thinking about the family as a sort of basic building block of society, I think I'm so used to thinking that myself, but maybe that that doesn't sound as if it's a way that's common in all cultures at all, at all times. It's just the one that we're in just now. It may be. I mean, I was really um, impressed by these uh, this North African community that I worked with who were were wanting to repair my connection with the divine because I was an orphan I I described myself as an orphan but to to point to the relinquishment I would say more as a verb that I am orphaned uh, I have been orphaned um, so uh, yes, that that was something. I mean, I think fa I think families have different um, meanings across cultures. But even in the the early twentieth century, as my adopted mother would say, um, you know, a kid on the street in the East End of London needing help was somehow became part of the family around the table if their parents weren't able to look after them, and that was what the adopt adoption laws protected the people who took in took in the children so um yeah i think it's it's fluid i loved listening to you emily i really did it was really i found that sort of rigor that you approach things with so interesting and i'm amazed to hear about uh critical uh, adoption studies um and we yeah it's brilliant thanks no you're welcome I think that I think that somebody in the comments said well what that's what we're doing and that's exactly right over in the you are um you it's one of the the projects of of the things that I think about and talk about all the time is to help people recognize that they belong in a field yeah, and the field exists and and um, what you're doing has tentacles all over the place in anthropology and psychology and um, literary studies and film studies. And it's, yeah, we, we are all looking critically at what adoption is culturally. Um, and yeah, it, it, and people just don't know. And it, it, um, it makes me sad sometimes. <laughs> Because we have so many friends and so many people to talk to, and sometimes we don't, we're not aware of that. But yes, you are doing critical adoption studies. Um, uh, one of the things that you may not know, or maybe it is in my biography, is that I run um, a journal called Adoption and Culture. And um, yeah, and, and that's been a going concern since 2007 for, for a good bit of time. Um, it's available on Project Muse. Um, and but if you just want to email me, you see something you want and you just want to email me, I'll send you any PDF of anything anywhere. So, um, yeah, and I have spare copies of books. I can mail those to you, too. I'm I'm super interested in people knowing each other and talking to each other. So, um, yeah. I just wanted to say there was a there was a great comment that, uh, that just came in um uh, into the chat and and it it was it was it was looking at kind of should we be redefining what a family is and this is something that um as a group and of course we'll we'll be talking more about these things on day two and hopefully opening up to 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 the audience as well to, to have to have their say um and and we have looked at this we this specific you know what is the law saying a family is and does it represent what what we see in communities and and, and i think it's a, it's it's wonderful i remember listening to um, to you speaking in belfast and that question was literally kind of where i was at after after belfast and so you know i, I think wonderful wonderful to get that point across thank you so much thank you and i think don's got a few questions as well but yeah no that that was just something that came up in the chat so so thank you for for whoever it was that actually popped that in it, it was really a good point so in the chat too there's a bunch of um of questions about does a child make a family and you know somebody asked me that the other day because i was talking about something else and um i think it does 
at least conversationally, but it's an interesting question. Like, how do you, how do you know you have a family? How does, how do families exist? So um, I was, what was I watching? I was watching something because I was trying to grade, you know how that is. And um, I was watching some TV and there was, somebody said something like, we're a couple, we're not, oh no, I was reading a memoir. We're a couple, we're not a family. We don't, we are not a family until we have children. Um, and you can hear this conversationally or co colloquially fairly often. Like if you just kind of pay attention, um, people will behave like this. Do you want to start a family? When will you start your family? Um, to married couples. So there's already something, but not a family yet, apparently. So I think um, the commenter who's asking for a definition of family, I think that's absolutely necessary. So I was looking at census rec records. My um, mother passed away in April, and so I got a bunch of paperwork. And I was looking at census records from the 30s for my mother. This is my adoptive mother, my adoptive mother's family. And um, they they actually list um, a, a spinster aunt and uh, a live-in maid as part of my mother's family in 1932. So sometimes these could be really, really stretchy, like even historically and maybe, uh, and of course I am talking about a middle-class US um, context in the 20th century. And so it could be, it could be that we need adoptions and we need families. Like we need a kind of range of understanding of these terms, but we haven't sorted those. And we use those words without actually having sorted the concepts very well yet, which I wish we would do. That would be really helpful, I think. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that we're quite passionate about moving forward is to get those words, that language and that context right um, in the very act itself. And then hopefully then, you know, we filter down into into these other areas of uh, that have concerns, you know, for, for generations. And, and, you know, earlier on when Josie was speaking, you know, we're talking about people before the act itself was even, you know, legalised. We're, we're, we're saying that there was problems, you know, we're nearly 100 years down the line in the UK. And as we know, what happened here filter filtered across the pond to you guys as well as you know in other areas and so it is important that we do get it right you know that th this act isn't just taken as you know well it happened then and it's changed because the act itself hasn't really changed you know even though best practice and, and we know all these things but yeah no yes Josie come on in <laughs> I, I have to say in this my understanding is that in this particular context uh, New York was, uh, in particular, was before the UK. That adoption was legalised in many other countries before the UK got round to it. Um, oh, that really seems to be it. Well, the adoption wow. with the orphan trains, and there were, there were, again, and my focus has been that the, the laws were put in place to protect the adopters I was I've been questioning why they needed protection but the but the um that that's how I understand it um at the moment so we um us I think New Zealand maybe was earlier it was we were in the UK we were were not the first Definitely. Yeah, we were, we we're in the we were definitely at the at the beginning, oh, but maybe not the first. <laughs> it's all about that. It's all at the same time. And when I mentioned that, I I really was interested when you say sort of circling back. I was really interested in that you said about uh, you, when you said conversationally a child creates a family because it suddenly felt like this centering of me in my adoptive family. It's like. I would I it gives me a little bit more importance that was the angle I was I was thinking of it I wasn't really making a comment on what should be a family it was really just that recentering that the orphaned person the 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 surrendered person as somebody who created a family is very helpful uh, in my psychology, if you know, it doesn't, it, if nothing else. Thank you, 
So my understanding and the place to go for information, at least on U.S. adoption, is Ellen Herman's website called um, the Adoption History Project. Um, and she'll have all of this information for you. And the U.S. is really weird because all of domestic law devolves to the states. So um, adoption um, law was adopted <laughs> was adopted state by state, it, starting in Massachusetts, actually, in 1851. So relatively early for um, for kind of the West for adoption uh, as a legal entity or a legal process. Um, and it was for a long time all about property. Like uh, the fear was that you would have an adopted, you would take in somebody then who would take everything and not be a true heir. And I think I was listening to John McLeod the other day talk about this, um, that the, 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 the UK resisted longer. I think you had 1921 is I think when you get your first adoption laws on the book. Is it is it earlier than that? 26. Okay. Thank you. Um, but there was there was a lot of fear about class crossing um, and property stuff that in um, that that was harder in UK culture, I think, than it it was in places where there was where people didn't have the kinds of generational wealth that. Yeah. And it comes to novels, you can yeah, <laughs> so we, we were like we were a bit we were a bit later. So UK nineteen twenty six and Scotland nineteen thirty. So that yeah, there was differences between the time lapses even in the UK. Yeah, yeah. And, and when it comes to looking at um, novels and um, seeing the characters in Wuthering Heights as as maybe an expression of the fear of somebody who's taken in, taken over, and not really belonging. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder with the difference in Scotland too, with um, the the kind of the land ownership, what you were saying about the property and stuff. It's it was only in the twentieth century that the very last of the land got enclosed and owned in a legal sense. Before that, it was owned by the clans and that the clans run it, but the clans weren't families as such. It was who it was the people who lived in the land so already there was like um dr joseph was saying about the east end of london a, a different kind of ownership that didn't involve on a legal separation of people from the land it was much more of an indigenous belonging mm. so we've had a little chat afterwards is everybody feeling quite okay and ready for a cup of tea, <laughs> another cup of tea. <laughs> it has got to that 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 time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little break and say thank you so much to Emily for your for for coming and actually chatting to us and giving us your your view on how these things have fitted in and where where you've kind of where you've come from and and where you're going because I think I think it's amazing and I think so many people will be following following up. Um, if there's any more questions, do do feel free to stick it in in the chat and we will we will continue to go through them. Um, we're going to take a short break just now so everybody can have a little um cup of tea, get get a toilet break, um, and then we'll be right back at twelve o'clock with Michael Lambert. Anybody who wants to stay on the panel, you're all, you're you're more than welcome to to stay. Michael will be joining us soon, um, and I think it, it's great because it opens up for for much more discussion for people who are watching. For all yous who are watching, um, we will see you back here at twelve o'clock. See you soon. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you. you. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs>